Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, it's good to have everybody back from your coffee break, and uh, we'll go into program number two, and we're starting book 73. Aren't you proud of me? <laughs> book 73, and uh, as a rule, I forget to do that. Also, she wants me to again remind our audience of the one and only book we've ever published, and yet it's been so well received. Uh, it's just amazing how they keep going out. We go to seminars, and they just go by the box full. Here, Craig, Gary. And uh, if you are interested in that, it's 88, 88 questions and answers taken from our program material and uh, covers the whole gamut, saves me a lot of letter writing instead of having to answer them all. And, and I do. I, I answer questions in longhand. And you know why? I don't want people to think that some staff member is answering my mail. We do it ourselves. <laughs> and so they may have a hard time reading my mail. But nevertheless, we thank you so much out there in television for all your prayers and uh, your letters of encouragement. And I, as I've said before, uh, mail time is the best time of the day. And then your financial help. We never ask for money, never have had to. And the Lord provides, but we still have to thank you for it. And uh, same way with all of you here. All right, we're going to keep on with uh, our teaching this afternoon on theophanies. And if we get beyond them, we'll go on to some of the uh, appearances of God in the incarnate. But hopefully we can spend the afternoon on the Old Testament theophanies. And uh, we're going to bring you now up to Genesis chapter 12, where we have the next direct spoken appearance of the God the Son. And as I mentioned in the last half hour, whenever you have God speaking or creating or doing anything, I think I'm without danger of being in error. It's always God the Son. God the Son is always the creator. He's always the one who speaks things and they happen. And uh, he's the one that always has direct contact with the human race. Now, like I said, in programs to come, we'll be dealing with the work of the Holy Spirit, but that's something totally different. Uh, when God the Son speaks and creation happens, yes, the Holy Spirit is involved, so is the Father. But the Scripture, especially in the New Testament, gives all the credit for it to God the Son. All right, but now let's come back to Genesis chapter 12 for a moment, and uh, we'll start at verse 1. We've jumped several hundred years now from Adam. We're up to Abraham at about 2,000. Verse 1, now the Lord, now again the word Lord capitalized is Jehovah. And Jehovah is the I Am, and the I Am is God the Son. So here we come right back full circle. We're dealing with God the Son. And so the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. All right, but now the word appeared still doesn't come up, does it? And as I said in the last program, I'm a little uncomfortable if I can't use the word appeared. And now I'm going to bring you all the way up to Acts chapter 7, where we have Stephen giving the whole rehearsal of Israel's history, starting with Abraham and uh, he uses the word that I'm looking for. Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Acts chapter 7, verse 1. I always like to give you time to look. And again, I had a letter the other day thanking us for giving time because I think all of our listeners must use their Bible while they listen to the program. And that's the only way we would have it. And so we do want to give you time to find these verses and see them with your own eyes because most people just do not know how to read and see what they're reading. They read, but they don't see it. All right, chapter 7, verse 1. And uh, we've been dealing with uh, Stephen up in chapter 6. So the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen answers, Men, brethren, and fathers... Hearken, the God of glory appeared, what's the word? Appeared 
unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now the word appeared there is the Greek word optometry, from which we get optometry, and it literally is translated visibly seen. And so here Stephen, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes it plain that the God of glory appeared visibly, physically, in a theophany. He did not take on human flesh like Christ did at Bethlehem, but he merely appeared to Abraham in human form and then went up from Abraham, as we're going to see in one of the other accounts in a little bit, how he left off and went up from Abraham, no doubt, back into that invisible Godhead that we pointed out in our last program. All right, now then, if you'll come back with me to Genesis chapter 12, here God appears to this pagan citizen of Ur of the Chaldees, evidently knowing that he had the ability to believe and be obedient to what he would have done. And so Abram then becomes the key player from 2000 B.C. right on up through to our own present day. Because everything in our Christian gospel, our Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior, however you want to refer to Christ, naturally has to go back to this promise made to Abraham. All right, chapter 12, verse 1 again. Now the Lord had said, having had appeared unto Abram, and he said, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. Now, never forget or lose sight of the fact who's making it happen? God is. This isn't just an accident of genealogy. This is a particular act of God that brings about then the nation of Israel. All right, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse him that curseth thee. And history has proven that over and over, that when a king or a kingdom or an empire turns on the nation of Israel in time, not always immediately, but in time, the wrath of God will fall upon them. And that's why we are so stressing constantly that you pray for America, that we will never turn on his people, the nation of Israel. All right, but then the last part of verse 3 is where you and I come in. 2,000 years before Christ, but already we have the plan of salvation for the Gentile world alluded to, that in thee, in this man Abram, as he's still called here, in this man Abram shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, of course, that's a reference to the fact that the Messiah would come to the nation of Israel and as the rejected Messiah then became the epitome of the work of the cross. All right, so here we have God the Son starting the nation of Israel on its roll through human history by an appearance to this great man of faith, Abraham. All right, now then if you'll go with me to chapter 17. And uh, we come over the birth of Ishmael. And uh, Isaac has not yet been born. Abram thinking, of course, that Ishmael is all he needs to get a nation of people going. But now in Genesis 17, verse 1, now we've got the word that I'm always looking for. 17, verse 1. And when Abram was ninety years and nine. That's almost a hundred. When Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord, now what's the word? Appeared, see? Visibly, physically, in human form, temporarily. And so he appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Now the Hebrew word there is El Shaddai, the Almighty. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. In other words, upright, be a mature man of faith. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now you see, 
how this has to come from deity. Nobody but the Creator God could make those kind of statements. But God can. And he says, I will make my covenant between me and thee. I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. And God, see, don't forget, where does God the Son come out of? The invisible Godhead. In fact, that I always have to do this. Can't help it. Jump up with me to Exodus chapter 3, I think I want. Yeah, the burning bush, got to be Exodus chapter 3. Just to make the point how that these terms of deity, deity become interchangeable even though we're only dealing with one person of the three, and it's God the Son. But all the terms of deity apply. Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 3. And it's when Moses is confronted with the burning bush out there on the desert. Verse 5. He said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, now watch this carefully, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. All right, now then, as you come down through the account of Moses dealing with God in the burning bush, you come all the way down to verse, oh, let's see, I don't want to skip any up in here, but come down to verse 11. And Moses again said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve me upon this mountain. All right, now we come on through then to verse 13, where Moses said, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they'll say to me, What is his name? And you remember when we taught this not too long ago on the daily program, why was Moses immediately interested in his name? Because every god in Egypt had a, gain, had a name. That was just part of his Egyptian culture. If you're a god, you've got to have a name. And so that's what it, Moses is anticipating. The children of Israel are going to say, well, what is his name? All right, Moses said, Behold, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say, What is his name? What shall I say? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now all the way through here we find this burning bush voice. I don't think it was an appearance here. That's why I'm not in my list of theophanies. But here this voice is the voice of God. But what person of the Godhead? God the Son. Well, now the first question the doubter may say, well, how do you know? Well, the I am. I am. Turn back with me to John's Gospel. See, that's why we have to go back old and new. It's the only way it makes sense. Now you come back to John's Gospel, chapter 8. And we've done this before. But repetition is the mother of learning. So I never really apologize for repetition. But on the other hand, I sometimes uh, shrink from it a little. All right, here in John's Gospel, chapter 8, you remember that... Uh, the uh, religious leaders of Israel are trying to trap him in one way or another. And uh, then in verse 48, they answered, or then answered the Jews, and said unto him, Say we not well, thou art a Samaritan, and you have a demon? What an accusation. <laughs> Awful. And he answered, I have not a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. So the conversation carries on up to verse 52. And then said the Jews unto him, now this is Jesus, of course, I trust you know that. This is his earthly ministry. And then the Jews said unto him, now we know that thou hast a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? And Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honoreth me, of whom you say he is your God. 
yet you have not known him. Boy, now that was quite an accusation to the Jew, wasn't it? Because the Jew figured that by being the child and son of Abraham, they had everything they needed. No, they didn't. They were still without saving faith, even though they were under the covenant promises. All right, so Jesus makes it so plain that of whom you say he is your God, yet you have not known him. They were religious, but what? Lost. Lost. Oh, they had all the religion in the world, but they knew nothing of God. And Jesus makes it plain. You've not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like you are. What a statement. Almost unbelievable, isn't it? But I know him, and I keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, You're not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? See how this fits with our theophany? Of course he did. Face to face. All right. Then verse 58. Here's why I know the I am of the burning bush was God the Son. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, what? I am. And what was the name of God in the burning bush? I am. And so all through the book of John especially, he is constantly referring to himself as the great I am. All right, now then, if you'll come back with me to uh, Genesis once again, to chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, and we find that, oh, I knew a point I was going to make at the beginning of the last program. I mean, that's maybe where I should make a note or two. That might help. But, you know, a lot of people question, well, doesn't the Bible say that no man can ever look on God at any time and live? Yes, that's what the Bible says. Well, then how can you sit up there and teach that here he appeared to Adam and Eve, and he appeared to Abraham, and they looked on God, all right, now what's the big difference? No human being has ever looked in on or has seen the invisible Godhead. And if they were to, it'd be instant death. So that's what the scripture means, that no man has ever seen God. They have never seen this invisible Godhead. But that doesn't mean they can't see God the Son. Got that? And that's why we can take these verses, and you're going to see more and more. I think the most obvious one is Jacob. And he names the place, Peniel. Why? For I have seen God, how? Face to face. Well, it didn't kill him, because he wasn't looking at the invisible triune God. He was dealing with God the Son. Okay, so back to Genesis chapter 17. And uh, again, God appeared unto him, and he said, I am the El Shaddai. I am the Almighty God. And he promises this covenant promise between God and the nation of Israel. And then it's up here in uh, verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father in many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now you want to remember, he does the same thing with Sarai, and he changes her name from Sarai to Sarah, which brings in the letter H, which is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that is the letter or the number of grace. And so it's God's grace that brings about the promises made with Abram and Sarai. All right, now I think we can go from Genesis 17 to, let's see, let's go to another one, back up a chapter, to chapter 16, and now we're going to deal with Hagar, which means that God doesn't appear just to the godly men. He sometimes appears to the, the secular, the unbelieving, and Hagar, of course, would be in that. Hagar was the Egyptian gal from whom Ishmael was born. But nevertheless, God deals with her on a face-to-face -face basis. All right, in uh, Genesis chapter 16, we're going to take, it's been a long time since we've taught Genesis, even though you've been seeing it in the, the reruns. Uh, I'm comfortable with going over it again. 
Here in chapter 16 now, after having been promised a son that would bring about a nation of people, Abram gets impatient, doesn't he? Well, time's going by, years are going by, and still no son. So of his own volition, and Sarah, of course, uh, encouraging it, he has a child by the slave girl, Hagar. All right, now you know the story, and I think I can bring it in up at verse, uh, oh, verse 4, where now he and Sarai have connived together that he would have a child by this slave girl, which was in accord with the laws of Hammurabi. It wasn't immoral according to their custom, so uh, we, we can't put any uh, sinful con connotation on it, except that God wasn't in it. This was something that they did without God's instructions. All right, so he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Well, of course, that goes back again to Middle Eastern custom. To have a son is the greatest thing that a woman can do. All right, verse 5. And Sarai I said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Now the Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, I behold, Thy maid is in thy hand. She's yours. You're the one that's in control of Hagar. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Now verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to shore. Now I've got to stop again. I have to be careful because there are some of our, what we call cults, who claim that Christ is nothing more than an angel, and they like to use a verse like this to back up their false teaching. So let's right off the bat stop, and let's pick up who is the angel of the Lord. So that there's no mistaking it. Come ahead with me to Genesis chapter... Oh my goodness, it should be chapter 40, 46 or 48, where is it? Yep, verse 16. Genesis 48, verse 16. See, we have to use these little tidbits of Scripture to, to solidify our thinking. Just because he's now called angel of the Lord doesn't mean that he's less than deity. It doesn't mean that he's part of the angelic host at all. Because here Scripture defines it. Genesis 48, verse 16. And Jacob is, of course, on his deathbed, and uh, he's pouring out his blessings on the sons. Verse 16. The angel who redeemed me from all evil bless the lads. Let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. All right, but the key part here is the angel who what? Redeemed. How many redeemers in Scripture? One. One Redeemer in Scripture. And so the angel of the Lord, the angel who redeemed, is still God the Son. And so when Hagar, now come back with me to Genesis 16, so that when we find that Hagar is confronted in a theophany the same way that Adam and Eve were, the same way that Abraham was, and now she says it in plain English, Verse 8. I've got to read verse 7 so that you don't forget where we came from. Chapter 16, verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he, the angel of the Lord, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence comest thou? Where'd you come from? And whither, whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with child, shall bear a son, shall call his name Ishmael. Now who but God could make statements like that? Well, they can't. And so we're still dealing with God the Son. All right, now then, come all the way down to verse... 13, and she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here 
looked after him that seeth me. Wherefore, the well was called Beer Lahai Roy, for it is be behold between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son, son Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore years old and so forth. But the point we want to make here is that she says here again that have I also here looked after him that seeth me. She was on a face-to-face -face confrontation with God the Son. Now we can come back once more. I think we've got a minute of time. If not, we'll continue it on in the next program. And that's right on into chapter 18. And once again, we come back to Abraham. Genesis chapter 18. And we just start right at verse 1, and the word is going to jump right off the page, isn't it? What is it? Appeared. See? Appeared. And the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Well, now, I haven't got time to go any further here in this program. We'll pick it up in the next one. But I usually make the emphasis here that in verse 3, when he uses the term, my Lord, he's not using the term deity, Adonai. He's merely using what we would call a term of um, reverence, or um, it's not the word I want, a term of uh, respect. He's merely respecting these three wayfaring men. And so he's referring like we would say, well, sir, if now, if I can find favor in thy sight, pass not away. Now, again, I'm making that point because I do not think that he recognized the Lord in his theophany here as he saw him back in a previous one. But we'll cover that in the next program, maybe to your satisfaction. But uh, always remember that the scripture is so adamant and is so clear that when these appearances, it was deity who was speaking. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of Scripture. And so we'll leave it at that and we'll pick it up in our next program. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.